Today, let's also invite on the show Ronak Onkar, the co-fund manager, <coughs> sorry, equity and head of research at PPFAS Mutual Fund on the show. Uh, Ronak, afternoon. This is Reema here. It's been a good year for the markets, right? Especially relatively. But the performance has been extremely divergent. On one hand, you've got banks, which are up 20%. But the, on the other hand, you've got IT stocks down 25, 30% so far this year. So as we enter in into the last leg of calendar year 2022, would you look at any kind of portfolio rebalancing and your thoughts on the markets and the setup and the positioning right now? Thank you, Rima, for inviting me. Uh, so from sector point of view, uh, if you see our fact sheet, uh, more or less the companies that we own have been in the fact sheet for a long period of time. Uh, the narratives don't change. In fact, cyclicality will, of course, definitely affect the shorter term performance of these companies. So you mentioned private sector banks, which we have been owning in the portfolio for a, a long period of time. And the story over there has not changed. The longer term trends that we are seeing as a private consumer franchise in the lending space, plus you have a fee income coming in from the subsidiary businesses and the existing businesses. That keeps on uh, being the case for all the private sector banks. And technology, we are seeing uh, the market anticipating perhaps uh, the recession-like scenario coming in with slower growth across different verticals. And naturally, if IT services companies, clients uh, may not want to spend more money, it might affect uh, some short-term cyclicality in their businesses, revenues, and profits for a while. And this has happened in the past. So this is nothing new which we're seeing. These, these short-term cycles do affect these companies. But I think if the longer-term trend remains the same, we will uh, mainly stay put with our holdings that we have. Okay. Hi, uh, uh, Ronak. Uh, good to speak to you this afternoon. I wanted your take on two stocks. One is Coal India, which has done phenomenally well. Now, when the company does well, a government-owned company does well, the problem is, uh, you know, the government of India gets tempted to come ahead and sell some stake. That could be weighing on the stock. And what about NMDC? That as well was a special situation that was playing out for you all. Uh, now you'll be bracing for the steel plant to list. But with the core business, will you all hold on? So with the coal business, our idea while we bought Coal India was essentially uh, the cash flow certainty that we could see. Uh, in fact, India has over a period of time, a five-year period of time, has gone from a power uh, surplus to a power deficit kind of a situation. And we are seeing that uh, no new thermal capacity has come up at scale. And whichever existing capacity is there is running at full steam. And you need all sorts of raw material available in order to uh, run these thermal plants consistently. So Coal India is a natural beneficiary to that consistent demand. And that demand leads to consistent cash flows. And that consistent cash flow leads to a consistent dividend payout. That's one of the reasons why we had uh, bought into Coal India. And because Coal India also is part of the index and we also get to uh, do the covered call strategy that we have in the fund. So a lot of these uh, aspects uh, make us hold Coal India for now, but maybe there is a short-term overhang in terms of government selling its stake. We will see how it goes up. But in MDC, the uh, demerger has already been uh, done and we'll wait for the listing of the uh, steel plant. Let's see how that situation plays out. Uh, in, in your portfolio, in terms of weights, uh, what is the, what's the weight of international stocks? Where was it, say, uh, a year ago? I mean, just some uh, perspective. Because, I mean, those rules have not... Uh, that relaxation actually has not come through, right? Uh, for the industry to be able to put more money. Yeah, so a year ago, you would have seen a third of the portfolio uh, being invested in global securities, mm -hmm. the global stocks that we own. Uh, but now it's somewhere close to 16%. So which has come down on accounts of the prices of those stocks falling. At the same time, incremental money has not been invested uh, in international stocks. So the weightage has come down from 30 to uh, 16%. And the rules remain the same. So we haven't heard any updates from uh, the regulators regarding the uh, repatriation of uh, funds to uh, buy foreign stocks. Half, right? I mean, uh, so, you know, you typically uh, being contrarian, you would want to increase exposure, right? This exactly at this point. Which, which one cannot do because of, uh, so I can, uh, it must be, uh, must be frustrating. I mean, how do you, is there a get around this? I mean, how do you, uh, how do you deal with this? So uh, investing in foreign securities for the fund house is not a, uh, it's not an old thing. I mean, we have been only investing in domestic stocks when we were running the PMS. We have a tax saver fund which invests uh, only in domestic stocks. And even the existing portfolio, we anyway have to invest up to 65% in domestic stocks. So we'll have to invest in our markets only. And whenever that uh, rule uh, comes up in our favor, when we can invest globally, we can again rebalance it. So rebalancing is in our hands. The whole idea behind investing globally was to essentially diversify and find unique opportunities which otherwise will not find in India. And that is the purpose of having the diversification. Otherwise, 
if there is a good enough business available in india to own we'll definitely own it mm. uh ronald the current buzz in the market are defense stocks some of these real psus but there's still a lot of disbelief about these stocks because they've gone through a very long period of underperformance years and years of underperformance there is interest right now there are government policies uh government uh, a trust from the government to boost uh, these stocks and their performance are you a buyer believer in these themes i think the only real stock we own in our conservative hybrid fund is the irfc uh, and irfc we bought essentially for the dividend yield uh, because the conservative hybrid fund is a, a debt fund Uh, but uh, across the broad spectrum of railway and other stocks in the psu categories i think it remains to be seen how the actual data comes out how these companies actually perform so you are right about saying that over a period of time there these stocks have been underperformers because the business has been not very steady so now if the data comes in and says that over a long period of time across cycles the business is doing very well uh, then it becomes a good case to track them and uh, you know we'll get some stability in how these companies perform in terms of cash flows hmm Ranak, I wanted to ask you about uh, the platform company. That's IEX. You know what a dream run the stock had. It went one way. Now on a month-to-month -month basis, you know everything's looking disappointing. Their volumes are looking disappointment. Where in fact we had the management, and he's sounding optimistic that things will recover. He said a couple of triggers are there in the month of December as well as January, which will protect their market share and volumes will pick up from there on. But you know, given that you have held the stock and it's it's half of what it was now at the peak, uh, would you look at adding more? So in the platform companies, the interesting thing is uh, actually like IEX, uh, the network effects are already established, and uh, near term I have no visibility as to how the business will perform. But in the long term, we know that there is a need for a power exchange uh, in various scenarios. Wherever there is a short term demand for power, both buyers and sellers need to have a trusted platform where they can immediately uh, match the orders. and no need to worry about uh, having some pending uh, quantity or capacity with them so it's interesting that exchange exists and also the competition point of view uh, it has to prove itself in terms of being a useful uh, utility for matching these orders so i think from an exchange mechanism and exchange uh, regulated entity point of view if you see global examples these exchanges are required and as more and more instruments keep coming up so right now we have only have a shorter term instruments if slightly longer term instruments come, keep coming up if renewable power becomes a larger part of the power supply and i think all these factors will definitely in the long run help uh, business of a exchange how well will iax do remains to be seen we will uh, wait and watch for the performance to catch up Thanks a lot for that, Rona. Well, a lot of moving parts on IEX actually. Uh, you know, there's one ski, uh, one school of thought that says maybe the current transaction fee itself will come in for a bit of a cap, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Always good hearing your thoughts. Thanks so much for joining in and speaking to us here on CNBC TV 18. Well, for the time being, we've seen a good recovery from the day's uh, low, close to around 30, 40 points odd. I think now, not only on expiry, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're seeing that 3 p.m. move, so to call it. So we were down 40 points. Now we're well. in the green slip in a short break nimesh is waiting for us on the other side he'll tell us what he's picking up in terms of dealing room chatter we'll have our technical experts as well who'll be back with us